Good morning, church family. Certainly glad to see you today. It's a cool and pleasant uh, autumn. Technically, it's still autumn. It feels like we just skipped right over fall into winter, but it's fine. Uh, We're all fine. Uh, We're glad that you're here today. It is the middle of November. We have just a handful of weeks left. It's going to go by fast, especially once holidays start ramping up and things. Before you know it, it'll be the end of the year. We'll be starting a new year. And with the new year, we'll be starting a new theme, which Alex and I will introduce to you sometime in the next several weeks. Uh, He's still on the other side of the world, so I'll wait till he gets back for that. But we are almost done as a result of this being November with our theme for this year, Wonderful Words of Life. For my part, I have just four sermons, including this one, left for the year. And I didn't want to end without at least having one more song that was an invitation song as the basis for our sermon. I hope that you have enjoyed, if that's the right word, or gotten something out of, as we sometimes say, uh, these various sermons that we've preached all throughout the year. I, for my part, I've just loved the theme. I had way more sermons than there were possibly Sundays in a year uh, when we first started working out what we were going to do with the year. It's just a great idea. I'm glad it was Alex's idea that he, he brought over uh, to us to use. And I'm sure that we will five, ten years from now, we'll whip this sucker back out and we'll do it again. I have a whole new slew of songs to study all year because the book is thick and there are only so many Sundays to consider the great hymns that we sing. But I have one more invitation song. We had an invitation sermon a few months ago. I have one more to share with you this morning. But I want to approach it from a slightly different perspective. I want you to turn your attention to a man. His name is Neil. And we're going to look at this figure as kind of a stand-in for the kind of people that we need to be who does what we need to do. This person, Neil, this metaphorical human being, not an actual person, is uh, an ordinary person. He's not remarkable in any particular way. He is not, uh, you know, uh, of a high rank of any kind of office or field. He is the most average, median, run-of-the-meal kind of person that there is. And yet this person, Neil, so ordinary in his stature and his presence and his demeanor, has done something that is extraordinary, has done something that is not usual, and has done something, and by doing this, he has set for us an example that we ought to follow. Neil has gone to the cross, and we need to be like Neil. Why do we need to be like Neil? Because Neil, as I said, has, by going to the cross, has done something that most people in this world will not do. They will, he has done something that most people in this world, when they hear about what he's done, and they hear the testimony of other people who've done it, will scoff and will want nothing to do with doing the same thing. But Neil is not like most people. He is a rare exception. You could call him a remnant of people who has said, despite the majority, I want to do this thing because I see the value in doing it. What has he done? He's gone to the cross. You heard the message that was read to us just a minute ago. Paul writing, the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. In other words, there's two kinds of people, only two kinds of people. And all of these, both of these kinds of people are going to hear the same single message that is the message of the cross, but they're going to receive it in one of two ways. And whether they receive it the one way or the other is entirely dependent on their attitude toward the message, whether or not they want to receive that message or not. Some people, when they hear the message of the cross, they take in the facts and the figures and all the things that are said, and they conclude it's nonsense. It's ridiculous. It's not worth my time. It's silly that I had to do all these things, change all these ways, live according to all those principles based on a, they would say, story 2,000 plus years old that itself, they say, doesn't even make sense. It's foolishness. But to us which are saved, Paul says, it is the power of God. And he doesn't mean necessarily it is a power that Paul wields or that I wield and that I you know, fire it off at people and I shoot forth the power of God into them. No, it is a power from God that affected Paul and affected all others who are saved. They, in other words, recognize this power as being from God. What power is it? The power of the cross. And those who don't want to believe that power, who don't want to receive that power, who don't want to accept that power, will conclude it's not power at all, it's nonsense, it's foolishness. But to those who are saved, they see the power of the cross. Neil is one such person. Neil is at the cross. 
Let's be like Neil. Why is Neil at the cross? Number one, because Christ has met him there and interceded for him there. Neil has gone to the cross because Neil believes what is read to us in various texts throughout the Bible that would lead him to conclude how much he needs to go to the cross. Let me walk you through a simple little thought process here and tell me if any of this doesn't apply to you because I guarantee it applies to all of us. First of all, Ezekiel 18.20 where the prophet, in the context, he's writing to an evil, sinful nation of Judah who have gone deep into sin and idolatry and they don't want to hear the preaching of salvation from the prophet. And so he says to them, you need to understand the stakes here. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, nor shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon him. In other words, if you do good, you will be blessed. It doesn't matter that your father did good or your mother did good or if your father did wicked or your mother did wicked. If you do good, you will be blessed. And the unrighteousness of the unrighteous will be on him. What will be on him? The punishment thereof. It doesn't matter how good or bad your parents were. If you are wicked, you will be punished. And to go back to the beginning of the verse, the soul that sins, that one soul that sins shall die. That's the penalty. That's the consequence. That's the action that everyone who has ever sinned will have to suffer. The soul that sins shall die. And you hear that and you think, well, he's not talking about me, surely. He's being very general. He's being very vague. I'm not even from Judas. That doesn't apply to me. It's some other soul that sins. It shall die. But then you read Romans 3.23 where Paul says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We once, all of us, were born righteous and pure and basked in God's glory sinless and remarkable in his sight and at some point along the way one temptation too many took hold and we succumb we sin and we walked ourselves over a bridge into a place of darkness and despair and spiritual depravity and the devil who tempted us there who lied to us to get us to cross that bridge then cut that bridge down and left us on the other side of a chasm we could not possibly cross and we face now with the grim reality of our depraved situation look over and see the light of christ on the other side and we desperately want to get back there but we have come short of reaching it we can stretch we can pull we can desperately desire but we cannot reach the righteousness that's on that other side we have made ourselves unrighteous we have sinned and the soul that sins shall die all have sinned second thessalonians 1 8 in the context of Jesus who has gone up into heaven and will in like manner so come back from heaven, when He comes back, He will come back taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the Gospel. He will come back in fiery vengeance, Paul says, with flaming fire taking vengeance on them who know not God and who obey not the Gospel. Those who rejected the message of the cross as foolishness and those who walked away from it after they once were saved by it. They've allow themselves to go on the other side of that gorge. They've stood on the other side of that canyon and they've said, I'm over here now. Oh, oh, now I can't get back over there. I've sinned. You've sinned. We've all sinned. We deserve to die. Jesus is coming back to see that you get what you deserve. Neil, however, has understood all three of those things and then gone to the cross. Why? Because it is at the cross where Christ intercedes. That through the blood of the cross He has made intercession and brought peace, Paul writes, between us and God. And were it not for the cross, then all of us who have sinned, which is all of us who ever have been, eventually will fall into that category. We'll stand to receive the flaming vengeance of God for our sins. Thankfully, before that happens, that same Jesus who is coming to bring fiery vengeance has first come to cut in the front of that fiery vengeance to intercede between the judgment of God and the punishment we deserve what did he do he went to the cross what did he do he died on the cross he died finish the sentence for me please I give you permission to talk Jesus died blank me what's the blank for Jesus died not just because of me that's true Jesus died not just to obtain me that's true Jesus died instead of me 
Jesus died so that I wouldn't have to die. He died taking the punishment that I deserved. That's, that was my cross on Calvary's hill. That was my cross on the hill of the skull that he climbed up onto and was nailed there on. That's my cross that he, innocent not guilty, died on. And in so dying, he interceded and he said, this is the death that this people behind me deserves, but I will take it so that they don't have to. He intercedes and in so doing, took the penalty upon himself, absolving ourselves from the justice of God, which means there is no fiery vengeance for us because we've gone to the cross. There is no more guilt of sin because we're on the other side of the gorge now. Now we don't die. Now we live. Kneels at the cross. Why aren't you? Next point. Kneels at the cross. And at the cross, he lifts up his voice and he leaves his cares with the Christ who is on it. What kind of cares do you have? This is November. This is the month of Thanksgiving. This is the month of giving thanks. Yes, we've had our tree up since Halloween, but we still appreciate Thanksgiving. This is the month of giving thanks. This is the month of being grateful for what you have. This is the month of count your many blessings, name them one by one. And yet for many people, this is the month where they cannot help, want to or not, they cannot help but see with more clarity than ever just how many problems they seem to have. Maybe it's the fact that so many people around them are a little more outward with their thankfulness, a little more obvious with how happy they are, that it brings out the misery in some people. And I'm not talking about sad, sack, bitter, angry people who just want to be mad. Those kind of people I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the people who are just really down, who are really hurt all year long. And then this time of year comes along, and the more people are happy, the more sad it makes them feel. Not that they're not happy that other people are happy. That they, they can't even get to that point yet. They're just so consumed by their own worries, their own anxieties, their own problems, their own what the old Bible calls cares. They don't know what to do. Over the, ye- over the months of the year, from January to November, they have accumulated care after care after care. Neil is like that. And what has Neil done? He sacked them all up, and he's laid them at the cross, and he said, I don't want them anymore. I'm walking away from them. I will leave with you my cares because I have way too many to deal with. Neil understood what what Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 7, a text I know you know very well. We've referenced it multiple times in sermons this year. It's a a kind of a mini theme that we've been hitting on. Casting all your, the King James says, cares upon him because he cares for you. But your Bible might not say cares if you look at it in your text. It might say cast all your concerns upon him. That's fine, he's concerned for you. Cast all your worries upon him. That's fine, he's, I'll use it in the worldly way we use the word, he's worried about you. My master doesn't really worry though. The phrase just means he is thinking about you. He's dwelling on you. He's, he, he has you on his mind, Peter says. So what's on your mind? Because the master has you on his. What's on your mind? Oh, I'm worried about this, and I'm worried about that, and I've got all these problems, I've got all these. Peter tells you, you don't have to worry about those things. But it's right there. There's the problem. This is my problem. It's not some abstract metaphorical thing. I mean, my car broke down. That's a problem. How am I supposed to cast my broken down car to God? How do we put the idea of 1 Peter 5, 7 into some kind of a practical application? Look at Philippians 4, 6, where Paul says, be full of cares for no reason. You probably might say say something like, be anxious for nothing. But here's what he's saying. You, You will be given a million and one reasons to be anxious. The world, the devil will provide for you a million and one opportunities to have worry, to have concern, to have care, to have things that will fill up your mind instead of thinking about Christ who's only thinking about you. So the world will give you all those reasons. Not a one of them is a good reason to worry. Not a one of them is a good reason to have a problem. But here's my car. It's broken down. I have to go to work. I have to make money. If I don't, I don't have bread for my food. I have a broken down car. What do I do? How do I cast that to God? Does he have a towing company? How does that work? That's not what it means. Your car is still going to be broken down. But when you give your worry over your car to God, it's not going to magically, this is not magic, and he is not Santa Claus, it's not magic where your car just is magically fixed or even miraculously fixed. Sean preached last week on the, the, the calming of the storm and the, the disciples in the storm, right? Sometimes the storm is calmed. Sometimes the storm is not calmed and the disciples are calmed. But the storm's still there. Yes, but you're not so worried about it anymore because you trust that God will get you through it. Your car might still be broken down, but I know a mechanic 
You know a mechanic. We know people, but I've got to pay for it. I know people who can help you with your money. I, I know a whole church family that's willing to pull together a special contribution if that's what it takes to help you. God's people take care of God's people. So why are you worried? Let me tell you why we worry. It's because we see the problem and we tell God, no, no, this is my problem. Stay away. I will deal with this problem. I will stew over this problem. I will worry about this problem. And what you don't realize what you're doing is you are telling God either you're on the same level as him or you're greater than him. Uh, Best case scenario, you're telling God you're just as good as he is. I know you can handle it, but so can I. I can handle this problem, but you can't. So give it to God. Or worst case scenario, you're telling God, you can't solve this problem. Only I can solve this problem. I have to have this problem. It's my problem. Mine, not yours. Mine, I'll solve it. And you're implying to God, whether you mean to or not, that he is impotent and you are all powerful. And that ain't truth either. The truth is, you've got a broken down car over here. The car is not your problem. You worry over the car is your problem because we can fix your car. Together, we can get your car fixed or we can get you some other way to get where you need to go but I can't help your heart. I can't fix your concern. That's got to come from the inside out. So with that in mind, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. There's the secret sauce. Let your request be made known to God. I've got this broken down car. I'm just going to sit here and stew over it. And what's that going to do? Is your stewing over it going to fix the car? No, it's not. Because it's a car, not a pot. You can't stew over it. So what do you do with it? First, before you do anything, you pray over it. That's not the last thing you do. It's not your last resort. It's your first resort. It's the first thing that you do. You pray with thanksgivings. I'm thankful that my car's broken down. No, you're not. But you're thankful that the car broke down before you were driving in it so that you didn't have a wreck. You're thankful that it's not, it could have been worse, that it could have been your house burned down instead of your car broke down. And if it was your house that burned down, you're thankful it didn't take your, your life for the lives of your family members, there's always some thing to be thankful for, no matter how bad the situation is. And by finding it, by piercing through the dark cloud, you see there, there is God at work. And you see a Father who is above, who is the giver of good things. And then together, with God and you and his family together, we'll get you through the problem so that you don't need to worry about it. But the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have a heart that is thankful. Because the more thankful you are, by, necess- by necessity necessarily the less worry you are nobody ever says count your many blessings while they're fretting over their problems it's just not your brain doesn't work that way so count your blessings be thankful neil neil has shown us the way you've got all these problems you've got 101 broken down cars and other like problems sack them all up take them to the cross and say jesus they're yours i can't deal with all this right now all i need to do is worry about you think about you neil's at the cross why aren't you Lift up your cares to him. Plead with him your cares. And begin life anew. Neil went to the cross. Why? Because Neil realized his life before the cross was not working out. It may have been fun sometimes. It may have been comfortable sometimes. It may have been easy sometimes. But it was going to end in misery. And so he's gone to the cross to start over. Or maybe, I don't want to presume, Neil, maybe Neil's life was not very fun. Not very good, not working out at all. Maybe he was in a very literal ditch. Not just a proverbial one, not just a spiritual one. And he thought, I need to change. I need to start over. I need help. Life is hard. I need help with life. And so he's gone to the cross for the same reason anyone should go to the cross. And then it's to start over. So here's what he did, Romans 12, 2. He transformed himself. He's not conformed to the world anymore. He sees how the world is trying to force him to be like the world, but that's only causing problems. So he's going to break free of the conforming of the world and be transformed. How? By the changing of his mind. By the literally making new of his mind. He will newify his mind. He will make brand new his thought process. That's what he did. How did he do it? He went to the cross. Look at Romans 6, 3, and 4. Or do you not know that so many of us as are baptized into Jesus Christ are baptized into his death on the cross? And we are buried with him by baptism into death. And just like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we are raised to walk in newness of life. Neil went to the cross because it was on the cross where Jesus died. And he said, after Jesus died, he was buried and came up brand new. I want to be brand new. So I will go to the cross and I will put my spiritual life to death and I will start a new spiritual life and I will raise myself by the power of God, a new person. 
What he did was he started over in his mind. How he did it was obeying the gospel and baptism. Why he did it was because Jesus told him to so that he might enter into the kingdom. Because Neil saw that the cross is not a destination but a doorway. And by crossing through that death, burial, and resurrection, he starts a new life on the other side. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't even see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? What's he going to do, get back in his mother's womb and be born? No, you worldly-minded thinker. It's not that kind of a birth, obviously. It's a spiritual birth. It has physical elements, but it's a spiritual birth. You're, you're reshaping the inside of you, not the outside of you. So unless a man is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus and provided for us, therefore, the why we obey the gospel of this described for us in Romans 6 so that we can have what is told to us in Romans 12 to have a new mind. Neil's at the cross to do that. Why aren't you? That's the, that's the question of the hour. Neil's at the cross. Why aren't you? I've given you all the benefits and I've given you all the blessings, but before we close, I have to end with this because some of you aren't at the cross right now. You're not on the other side of the cross right now. So what's keeping you from doing that? Maybe you've got too many things over on this side of it that you love more than the cross. To that I say, give your idols up. Because as Paul says in Romans 6, 21 through 23, what, 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 what were you getting out of your old life? What was the advantage of your old life? You sowed the seeds of disobedience to God, and now you've borne that fruit, but the fruit is killing you. The, the benefit of it leads to death. If you stay on that course over there, on that side of the cross over there, you keep going down that path over there, it will end with your death. A servant of sin, condemned by God. But you don't have to do that. You can become a servant of righteousness, wherein is not death, but eternal life, which is the gift of God. So give your idols up. They're not doing anything for you but killing you. They may be pleasurable. They may be fun in the short term. But they're not helping you at all. Give them up, and when you do, don't turn back. Leave them behind. Turn not again. Turn not again to life's sparkling cup, the allure, the, the, the short-term pleasure, the shiny, dangly thing that the devil tempts in front of you as he tries to lead you over that bridge he's planning on cutting in a little while. Don't turn back to it. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Don't turn your eyes to that sparkling cup. Instead, set your mind on things above not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the world. Set your eyes, your mindset, your focus, your desires, your goals on things above, not on things down here. Because you are at the cross now. Give your idols up. Don't turn back to them. Only keep your eyes on it. And after you've done that, trust. Because once you obey the gospel of Christ, the devil will target you and he will come after you with everything that he has. You think he'll give up on you because you left his custody? No, he wants you back in his custody. He wants you reshackled to him. So he will offer you the carrot sometimes, and sometimes he will offer you the stick. And sometimes he will beat against your mind, and he will make you doubt, and he will make you question. He will make you wonder, am I really saved? Am I really doing what's right? Maybe the whole thing is just a big, big root. No. No, trust in the love of Christ. Trust in the cross of Jesus Christ. Trust in the light that shines from the cross of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from our sins. In other words, as long as you are in the light, as long as you are at the cross, you will never be lost. As long as you are in the light of that cross, you will never be lost. Are you worried about being lost? You never need to worry about being lost. Has anyone ever told or asked you, are you saved? And you said, well, yeah, I hope so. You never need to cross your fingers and just hope that you're saved. You can have true biblical hope rooted and grounded in knowledge and faith and certainty because you are at the cross. If you are at the cross, you are not lost. You cannot be lost. You will not be lost. Jesus' grip on you in the cross is too strong for the devil's clawed fingers to pry you out of. The only way you're not going to make it is if you get away from the cross. So why are you not at the cross? As you should be. Go to the cross. Jesus will meet you there. He will intercede for you. You can leave Him all of your cares. You can leave your idols behind and turn not back to them again, but instead trust in Him that he will carry you home 
through the way of the cross. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I don't know what else I can tell you. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross? Is it, is it foolishness to you? If it is not, then see the power of God to save you in it. Believe it. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in that one who died so you wouldn't have to die. And be baptized into him for the remission of those sins. Then just be faithful. You're not going to be perfect. If you're going to be perfect, you wouldn't have needed the cross in the first place. You're already not perfect. You're not going to be perfect. Just be faithful. And heaven will be yours. And if you are a Christian but you've not been faithful, you've walked away from the cross, it's as simple as turning around, walking back into light. And if we can help you with encouragement or prayer or support or whatever we can do for you, let us know how right now as we stand and sing.